data that could be available to us as an organization. And as I go through the, the, the presentation, I'll explain why I think we're purely skimming the surface right now and how much potential there is left. But let's start. The first thing we have to start with, and I'll talk about some of the things that we think about as DBS, as we think about data. The first is you have to acknowledge a shift. We've gone from the industrial era to the transaction processing, the mainframe. We're now in what we call the information era, the, the Googles, the Hadoops, the mobile capabilities. And fast emerging is this what we call cognitive computers. We're working with IBM on a project called Watson, which is really the understanding uh, of the spoken, spoken word. And really what that means to us is we've got huge structural change. We need to bring innovation into the organization. And we have to find passionate technologists to do so. So I looked at a survey recently, this is from IDC, talking about what's on the minds of organizations. And it's something very different, market expansion, customer this, blah, 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 that. And it struck me that actually most organizations are not focused on the things we think are most important. The focus on passionate technologists in the organization, the focus on innovation, and the focus on structural change. And if you look at each one of these technology eras, it started off back in the 1960s. This is Mr. Watson himself who developed the mainframe, passionate technologies who saw structural change. As we went into the personal computing era, Steve Jobs, a passionate technologist that saw structural change and focused on innovation. Generation three was with the internet and opening up the internet with, with a couple of people that were passionate technologists. Generation four, as we engage social media and brought that to people, was focused on passionate technologists. So we ask ourselves constantly, what does Generation 5 look like? And maybe something like this, you know, a fresh student out of college with a passion to create. Actually, actually this is a picture of my daughter, but that's irrelevant. It's kind of, it makes the point, right, that really what big, big focus of DBS is getting the right talent and turning all of our legacy people, if you like, into passionate technologies. It's less about the systems, more about the people. And so we have a lot of them. Uh, this is our graduate intake from last year, a bunch of technologists who we train on modern design, we train on innovation, we train on technology, bring these people in to create this passion technology of the future. And it's very interesting if you look around the globe, uh, in the UK there's this article recently uh, talking about schools in England where it's going to be mandatory, mandatory to train computer programming. Uh, and this is from five years old up. It's going to be part of the, the syllabus and curriculum. So they recognize the importance of starting early on this journey of uh, creating people who understand uh, how technology can be applied. And if you're never too young, you're never too old. Uh, recently, I, I, um, uh, early last year, I signed up for an app developer license. So I'm now a kind of fully accredited uh, app developer. I do it in my spare time. It's a little bit of a stretch to get uh, uh, to understand Objective C from a long time ago since I originally programmed. But the point is that, you know, why do I why do I do this? Because I think it's very important that people understand what this technology can do. And as a leader of the organization that is driving a whole mobility strategy, how could I possibly do that without understanding how the device works in some level of detail? And we'll talk about some experimentation that I played with uh, later as part of that journey. So passionate technologists, real key focus of us, and, and that's not just uh, the young guys, but that's also the older people as well, of how we retrain people to think about this. Then the question is, what do we build? Well, I think most of us are focused on this. We're focused on putting fun apps on the glass. Uh, most organizations now have a whole suite of mobile, uh, tablet-based applications. We're the same. Um, you know, we win awards for this thing, etc., etc. And really, the new normal uh, that I, I will not talk about is this whole context of you know understanding our customer with the context of that customer, of velocity, uh, getting to a single source of truth about that understanding of that customer, and creating a segment of one individual. Now, I think I'll hang myself next time a vendor comes and talk to me about how they can do this. To me, this is kind of the new normal, right? If, if you're not focused on this, the organizations, you really haven't uh, got with a program yet. Uh, and I think we've got to think way, way past that into what are the next two or three iterations uh, of how data can be applied to uh, organizations and, and our company. You know, most people back in the uh, you know, early 2000 and thousands started thinking about this data warehouse as the key to everything. Uh, I think the guy from Cloudera kind of blew that apart. It really will not solve all your problems. And so any of you guys are out there building a data warehouse now, don't bother. Uh, things have moved on substantially and it's not really you know, when we look at this as DBS, we say, well, the data is important, but it's not just about the data. And here's why we don't think it's just about the data. You know, data is talked about as a bit of the new oil. Data is the new oil. It's a new natural resource we have. And 
So yes, we've got uh, data technicians and we're building applications around this thing, but to us, you know, what's more important is what's the product you're gonna create. To have people who understand how you can build new product from that, from that data. Uh, I have a great example of that from the oil industry in my, my pocket, and it's a simple Tupperware container. And, and really, to me, it's less about the data, it's more about the product. What are, what are the new products that this data enables, and how do we get all of our product managers in the business to understand that, and therefore have the ability to create and think forward? But actually, for Tupperware, the story goes on that the most successful thing about Tupperware was not the product. The most successful thing about this was actually how they marketed it and what they created from it. And what they created was a brand new ecosystem. It's back in the 1950s, and it was an era where not many women had employment, and they figured out that women uh, you know, needed something to do, some relevance, some way to earn and generate money. And they came up with what could be described as the first product ecosystem known as a Tupperware party. And for DBS and for many organizations out there, we think the biggest challenge is actually figuring out what is the ecosystem play you're going to make to, to put your product into and then worry about the data once you've figured all of that out. If you look at something like uh, Apple Pay, Apple Pay is a very interesting case where they had all the components of the technology uh, quite some time ago, but they waited until it was complete and they had full ecosystem to launch. Now they have all the payment providers, they have 500 banks, uh, they enable the technology down to the device and make it seamless. You know, the key thing, many, many organizations are coming up with products to try and revolutionize the payment industry without the ecosystem. So thinking ecosystem and how that changes and evolves and how we play in it is something that really obsesses us uh, at DBS. So once we think about passionate people, the ecosystem, you know, then we start to think about well, how can we really apply data to change how our organization operates. And we do some pretty interesting things. If we think about some of the core tenets of, of a bank, we have to be robust. We're trying to create ourselves to be a nimble organization uh, that knows how to do things fast, quickly, efficiently. And then obviously you want to go and explore the brave new world and, and make sure we're hooked into the ecosystems that are working on this uh, these series of, new, series of new technologies. So let's talk about robust platform first. Now, one of the things that uh, Steve mentioned and a couple of others was this notion about uh, strong security platforms. We're using data now as a big driver of our security, bringing the customer into that data journey with us. So we were the first company globally actually to use complex event real-time processing as part of our fraud protection mechanisms, and many of you will have experienced that in various ways as customers of ours uh, through various uh, mechanisms that, that detect whether or not we think there is something strange going on and including you in the verification process. That also enables us then to do this segmenting and, and start to offer uh, based on a segment of one. But the other thing then we look at is things like this. Uh, anonymous, who uh, again are out there uh, trying to attack governments. Um, we, we get millions of hits a day uh, coming in. Uh, literally millions of hits a day. Uh, this is our command center that we use to control many of our systems and control security. Um, and so now we've got a lot of this data going into uh, data extraction engines to go figure out of those millions of hits, uh, what are the ones where we think we may be under some serious attack that need, need investigation. Without data and analytics, there is no way that we could defend ourselves the way we do. Uh, and that now comes into how we look at uh, other risks. So we have risks at branches, you know, things go wrong in branches. Things go wrong in trading activities. You heard about the London Whale, which kind of killed the JP Morgan for a while there. And sales practices going on. So how can we use data to go and predict more accurately where we think things are going wrong in, our, in the operation of our organization? we we'll take the branch risk one for, for, for starters. So typically our audit team would go and audit branches in a fairly sort of branded fashion and try to figure out what they thought the high risk branches were. They had no real idea. So now we're, we're actually partnering with uh, I squared R, part of the uh, A-Star research uh, program. To go figure, we have 100 different types of data elements now coming into this uh, analytics engine. To use that as a predictor, can we tell from minute signals that are going on in this hundreds of different types of data, uh, data elements where we think we have the most risk? The interesting thing is the uplift we get. So if I just show you this chart, this little 
uh, whoops, what happened? Oh, oh, well, hit the wrong button. There we go. Uh, this chart. So uh, there's the sort of um, middle black bottom line is the sort of like hit and miss ratio, 50-50, right? Uh, I, I have no idea, basically. Um, but, you know, worryingly enough, the, the blue one is what audit do. So they are basically about as good as a monkey. <laughs> And our analytics now, you see the lift that we're getting from this. We get now, if you read off the chart, about an 80 20 hit versus miss ratio of being able to predict using analytics where we think the highest risk branches are. So we're very excited about this. We're going to apply that to trading, we're going to apply it to sales practices, etc. So we're going very, very deep to very, very low signal strength uh, data elements uh, to drive our understanding of behavior in the organization uh, with the aim of protecting ourselves and protecting you, uh, all of our customers. So we see that audit, uh, and it's a kind of boring topic, but audit all, 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 all of a sudden becomes very interesting. We get predictive, uh, we get analytical around it, and proactive around forward predicting events uh, before we, uh, uh, we hit the, the news or we have some uh, issue that we have to deal with. Of course, the same applies to biometrics. Um, we had Vicky talking about how we secure the devices. For us, for us, authentication of you as an individual is one of the toughest challenges we have and one of the things that the cyber criminals are most focused on. So we're driving a lot of uh, data around uh, analytics to go try and figure out are there better and more secure ways to go figure out who you are so when you use this device to access us, we know it's you, not a man in the middle, or not your, uh, you know, somebody who's taking the phone or whatever else. So analytics and data are playing a big, big part to us in, in securing our organization. So let's talk about Nimble now. How are we using data to drive efficiency, productivity, better customer service in, in DBS? Well, you know, we talk about the future of employment, and you know, people talk about the, what I call the little F, right? Which is the collaboration, mobility, all this kind of stuff. We have to have social data in the organization. We think the future of employment is, is actually much bigger than that, what I would call the big F. And to me, the big F is that we see 50% of jobs ultimately being eliminated by technology. We see data analytics-driven enterprise, and we see knowledge-based systems of engagement as the real way forward. And that's really where we're investing our dollars. Uh, the little F stuff kind of comes uh, and it's fun, but it's not going to fundamentally change the way we operate. So let's take ATMs as an example. We have lots of data about our ATMs. These are the charts we used to use to go figure out when and where an ATM should get filled. And uh, now we bring that all into our uh, analytical engine and we can predict forward uh, using kind of analytics of years of uh, back-tested data seven days out in advance where an ATM needs to get filled to optimize the cash delivery, make sure it doesn't run out of money, uh, and, and, and optimize the load. We're using SAS for this, and we're using some of the more advanced uh, prediction and uh, forecasting tools that they have. In fact, it was a, it was a showcase uh, project for them uh, to explain how we could use analytics to drive that. You know, the cool thing was that not only did we really achieve some significant results in, in service quality, but we get a huge amount of knowledge uh, about how we can use forecasting to really optimize the enterprise. And of course, at the end of the day, we make happier customers. Uh, and through this initiative, about 300,000 happier customers a year where they arrive at an ATM that's not uh, out, of, out of cash. So, if you, um, if you sort of extrapolate, that's the internet of things, people talk about things. Um, yeah, here's a tennis player, Serena Williams. She was uh, here just last week in the, uh, the tennis finals. Uh, maybe many of you saw them. She was not having a great moment at this uh, precise point in time. It was the game that she lost disastrously, and you know she's kind of cursing her serve. I don't know exactly what she's saying, but she seems to be grunting, and the, the letter F seems to be coming out of her mouth. I don't know what she's talking about, but not a happy camper. The fact is, though, we know why she's not a happy camper uh, because of this. We run, you know, they run very, very tight analytics around that individual. Uh, around every single step she makes, every move is closely analyzed and used to optimize her performance. So if you think about Serena as an employee of a company, her own employee, you know, what do we, what do, we do internally with DBS? Well, here's you know, our equivalent, the call center operator. And if you think about how we optimize a call center operator, you know, traditionally it's how many calls, what's the, what's the customer SAT score, all the rest of that stuff. Uh, but we go much deeper now into taking the voice, turning that into text, analyzing the text for all sorts of little signals in there. You know, they add a certain type of call correctly, another one incorrectly. What are they best at? What are they worst at? How do you cross-train? How do you retrain? 
or sharing a good day or a bad day this day, setting our customers, you know, what's going on as we analyze the speech and the text. And again, we think we're just scratching the surface of what is possible here, uh, but we see that you know, there's huge opportunity around this whole optimization of not only things, but people in our, in our organization. You take that forward to knowledge management, we're working with Watson, uh, many of you will uh, know what that is, it's to, uh, a system that can read and understand and interpret uh, the, written, the written word, and we're using that to see if we can rev revolutionize or reinvent the process of knowledge transfer between humans. If you think about a bank giving advice, we're really transferring knowledge from a research person to a marketer to a customer to help them understand what product is best for them to buy. And it's a pretty horrible process. It's completely broken. And here's why. There are hundreds of markets, there are daily forecasts, there's research reports, there's 5,000 pages a day for this person, the, the relationship manager, to really understand what's going on in the world. And then they have to apply that to all of the structured data we have in the organization. Hundreds of customers, historical prices, we have 8,500 bonds they could choose from, we have personal preferences, we have products knocking out, knocking in, cash going into the account. It's pretty impossible. And so what happens when the RM comes in in the morning is do they try and marry this data up? Well, it's an impossible task. So they pick up the phone, call the people they know best, and give the top three tips of the day. It's hardly personalized. There are about millions of possible outcomes, and probably 99% leakage of the data, the information that we have, that we could impart to the customers, it gets lost. So there has to be a better way. And now we're using Watson to say, how can we marry that structured data we have about preferences, product holdings, history, together with research report in unstructured written word, and find the right match for the right customer so the RM is guided uh, in terms of what to advise out to the customer. So first off, we're doing it with the RM, and then we'll look at seeing how we can push some of that straight out to the, the customer. It gets us into a different world from deterministic systems to probabilistic systems, uh, from search to cognitive, from going to rule-based to hypothesis-based. It's pretty interesting technology, and we've seen some fascinating results in round one, but you know, we see wealth management is only the start. You know, any knowledge worker in our or any other organization uh, could benefit from this kind of knowledge transfer uh, technology. So as we go explore, uh, we experiment uh, relentlessly. Um, you know, the Amazon person talked about that, but that's a key, key, key focus of ours. How do we get an organization of experimenters? Um, and how can we help them think about that? So we actually have a group that now does experimentation as a service, ZAS, uh, we, we call it. And you know, that helps different groups go figure out not how they just design the product from the bottom up, but how we experiment. Uh, in fact, my uh, experiment as I built my first uh, iPhone app was talking about uh, how I get a free, how I remember to use a free car parking coupon in Singapore. You know, you all get these free coupons and when we get to our car, we forget to take our cash card out. And then when we hit the barrier, then we realize we should have taken the cash card out. And I, I kind of figured out a way to, to solve for that. But in doing that, I linked the parking coupon together with some technology that James Bond used to employ. And what I saw there was the future of banking in a whole number of different ways about how we use location-based services. I'll have to sort of maybe chat to people over lunch about that, what that was all about. But the whole point here is that we used an experiment on a card, and that ended up uh, as doing a lot of work now with this same technology on future banking. So we, this idea of pivoting, uh, using hackathons, this is a hackathon we ran um, a couple of months ago in India, and this week in Singapore, we're taking our uh, senior leadership teams, we have this uh, people development program, and you talk about leadership, you talk about all that kind of stuff. So this week we're taking two days of their time, and we're locking in the room to talk about experimentation, innovation, talk about design methodologies. And then the following three days, we have a bunch of people who are invited into a hackathon together with our executive team. So we're going to lock these senior executive bankers in a room with a bunch of kind of uh, hackers and see what happens. We're either going to have some wonderful product at the end or World War Three on the hands. I'm not sure which way it's going to go, uh, but it's certainly an interesting experiment to learn how we get that culture of innovation, fail fast and reinvention uh, into the company. We're working with I Squared R, but the, the government sponsored labs. We have a joint lab there. We're looking at biometrics, we're looking at mobility, we're looking at how we apply data science to a whole range of different uh, facets of our business. So we think we're really at the very early stages. You know, when I say less than 10% of the data that we really use, I think actually it's probably at 1% or below. If you think about every single conversation that each of our relationship managers has with our customers or our call center has with our customers, 
you think of the vast amount of documentation that we have, we're really, really only peeling the surface of what we think is truly possible uh, in the world of data. So um, with that, I'll, uh, I'll finish. I do have, though, a, 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 a final word which just says, OK, what are the four things then that I would leave you with? The one is that I think we have to get passionate technologists. I think we have to experiment relentlessly. I think you have to instrument everything. And I think you have to think ecosystem. Those are the big four, I would say, that DBS were focused on of how to change our organization. OK, with that, I'll finish. And thanks very much for listening. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you so much.